Um, as I say, you don't need to know too much detail on each of these, but uh, Kepler and his three laws of planetary motion, all right? I'm sure if I stopped someone in Skipton High Street and said, what's wrong with the ancient theories, they'd all say they've got the Earth at the centre, that's wrong. But actually, in terms of getting the right answers and making prediction, the shape of the orbit is probably the more important thing, all right? So it's obviously much less well known. But discovering the true shape of the orbits had a big impact on our understanding of orbits, of how planets move, and etc., etc. Okay? So, quite rightly, this led to three very famous laws of planetary motion. All right? And if you have got a bit of paper, it would be a good idea to just jot these down. Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Okay? Uh, you do need to know these for the exam. Uh, up to the point where you could be asked to recall them, all right? So they could just give you a blank bit of paper and say for two marks, write down Kepler's second law of planetary motion. Okay, so these three laws, all of which are in the specification, all right? If you've been to the Edexcel website and downloaded the specification, you can find all three of them listed there, okay? The first two particularly, you often get asked to recall. So they say for two marks, write down the second law, something like that. Um, the third one, you're quite often asked to do calculations with, all right, and that's worth spending a bit of time on this afternoon, okay? The first law, again, if you're asked to explain these laws, probably the best way is to draw a diagram. People don't, it says state Kepler's second law, you don't need to write it in words, you can put it as a diagram if you want to. So, if I was asked to explain Kepler's first law of planetary motion, what I would do might be to draw, let's say, a planet going around the sun, okay? The two things you've got to get are the idea that the shape of the orbit is an ellipse. Okay, don't use the word oval. E W L I P S E. Careful with that ellipse, ecliptic, and eclipse. Okay, if you put those words in the wrong place, you're going to get the wrong answer. So the planetary orbits are ellipses. In fact, they all are. The moon going around the Earth, the Earth going around the Sun. Every orbit is caused by gravity and therefore falls into an elliptical shape. Okay. This might be not a very good idea for a planet. An orbit as elliptical as that wouldn't really be a planet. If I draw the Earth's orbit to scale, it's going to look something like that. And you're going to say, well, that's one of the best attempts at a circle I've seen you do in many years, Mr King. That's not a bad circle. But if you were to measure that distance and that distance, like the height and the width of the orbit, they're not exactly the same. Okay? But the thing I've drawn here is an ellipse. It has two centres. Don't ever write that because that's nonsense. Ellipses have points that you need to use to draw them, and each one of those is called a focus. All right. The pair of them are called foci, or foci, whatever. In the case of the Earth, the two foci are very close together. And what that means is where this is 93 million miles or something, that way it's 93 million out of a few thousand miles or something. All right? The difference between these two distances is very small. Something like this might be the orbit of a comet, and the two foci are obviously a long way apart. It's called an F1 and F2. That would improve our diagram. Kepler was very bothered about the other one. He wondered about this other one. It's just the, the mirror image of that one. But the sun is always at one focus. So if you want it as a snappy sentence, the orbits of planets are all ellipses with the sun at one focus. All right, that's what Kepler discovered. The orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at one focus. Okay? I've actually drawn the orbit of a comet because I've drawn a very cigar-shaped thing. And you might see, if we carry this on, if I put the two foci on top of each other, I get the... I'm trying to a bit of imagination. Can you imagine if the two foci are put on top of each other, you get the special type of ellipse called a circle. A circle is where the two foci are on top of each other. And as you know, if you measure the width of a circle that way and that way, you get exactly the same answer. Okay? Now what we're talking about here is basically how cigar-shaped, how oval, how elliptical they are. If you want to get this right, what you're talking about here in... Uh, astronomy is called eccentricity. The eccentricity of a circle is zero. You with me? So how elliptical is it? To be honest, you can write that in the exam. How elliptical is it? We know what we mean by that. That's fine. Technically, that's not quite right because they're all ellipses. Okay? It's a bit like saying, how pregnant are you? It doesn't make sense. You either are or you're not. Okay? 
But people use that word. So I could put here ellipticalness. Don't ever use that word. Um, the proper word is eccentricity. This has a very high eccentricity. I don't know what the number is. It varies from comet to comet. But comets can have extremely long cigar-shaped orbits. Okay? And they are characteristic of a high eccentricity ellipse. You can have relatively low eccentricity ellipses, like the Earth's orbit around the Sun, or the planet's orbits around the Sun. They are ellipses, but they have relatively low eccentricity. That's why it took thousands of years to realise, because they look very similar to circles which have none. Okay? So the quantity, this is outside the syllabus, eccentricity. You can just say, not very elliptical, very elliptical. That will be fine. All right? But if you want the proper scientific way, that's it. Okay? So if you want a sentence, the orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at one focus. The end. Okay? Kepler's second law, I think the first law, the way I like to think about it, it tells you about the shape of the orbits. Well, it would be. Think about the life of Johannes Kepler. He spent his whole life basically discovering the true shape of the orbit. So unsurprisingly, his first law is all about that. The second law is to do with the speed. Kepler didn't really know this, but an elliptical orbit means the planets sometimes come closer to the sun and are sometimes further away. The moon does it. The uh, lunar eclipse we saw the other night was particularly spectacular because the moon happened to be quite close to the Earth in its slightly egg-shaped orbit, and so we got a larger moon to have an eclipse. Okay? Now, the idea of Kepler's second law is very, very simple. Okay? It's a very simple idea which is basically when a planet or an orbiting body is close to the sun, think about it, the strength of gravity is going to be quite strong, so if it wants to avoid being pulled into the sun, the planet or whatever's orbiting has to go very fast. If you go much further out, then the planet needs to go quite slowly. If Pluto, I think the Earth charges through space at 10 kilometres a second or something, if Pluto did that, at that enormous distance where the, sun is mets, the sun's gravity is much, much weaker than it is here on Earth, then it would just carry on. Remember, it's the sun's gravity that's stopping these great big objects called planets from just going off in a straight line. All right? So planets out here must travel slowly, planets here must travel fast. This point, you'll remember, is called... That's it, I remembered. Perihelion. Helion from the sun, as you know. That one's that, helion. Okay, so at the point where you're close to the sun, perihelion, there's a way to remember it. Peri means close and at means far away. The way to remember it is peril. Think of the word peril. If you went close to the sun, you'd be in great danger, wouldn't you? You'd be in great peril, get it? So remember, peril, perihelion, because you're close to the sun, you're going to get burnt. Aphelion is when you're furthest away. The basic idea, though, is a simple one. If, when planets are near perihelion, they have to go faster. When they're at helium, they need to go slower. Otherwise, they fly off into space or get pulled into the sun. Okay? Now, Kepler, being a great mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians of his age, did things a bit more precisely than that. Okay? He came up with a very important idea, and it concerns this line. It concerns the line between the sun and the planet. And he gave this a name. He called it, you need to know this, the radius vector, okay? So the line between the sun and the planet is called the radius vector. Think of it like a big stretchy arrow. So as the Earth goes round, this can get longer for aphelion, shorter for perihelion, and round it goes, okay? Think of that line like the hand of a clock. As this planet moves round its orbit, can you imagine what this radius vector does? It goes round, it gets a bit longer, and it gets longer and longer and longer, it gets very long out there, and then gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Can you imagine this line going round? It's a bit like an elastic hand of a clock. The hand of the clock goes round, but it doesn't stay at a constant length like most clock hands do. It's going to have to get longer and shorter. I haven't got a whizzy app on the board to show you that. Can you imagine that with your, with your brains? Kepler noticed, he said, well, let's imagine that we time the planet. Let's suppose that we watch the planet for, let's say, I don't know, one month. And we said in one month the planet moves from there to there, and so the radius vector moves like that. Okay? And he said, let's consider that area. 
Having said, think of it like the hand of a clock. Think of it like a giant paintbrush. Can you imagine the radius vector's got paintbrushes underneath and the whole thing's on a big piece of paper. In one month, the radius vector would paint out oops, that area. Does that make sense? Kepler said, let's do the same thing when it's over here. Let's imagine what's going to happen when the planet is over there. And by looking at the maths of the planetary positions, he found a very interesting connection. He said, let's run the planet for a month out here. All right, so let's run it right out beyond the orbit of Neptune or something. Let's run it for one month out here and see how far it goes. Now, we said before it's going to go slowly. All right? It's going to go slowly, so it's not going to go around. Think of it like a hands of a clock. It's not going to go around quite as quickly. What Kepler noticed was it will go so that these two areas are the same. Okay? And this is sometimes called the equal area rule. Um, he basically found that the hand of the clock, which we call the radius vector, moves quickly here, but it's quite short. Out at aphelion, it moves much more slowly, but of course it's much longer. So he tried various things. Does the radius vector always have the same length? No. Does it always do the same angle? No, unless the orbit's a circle. What he found was the radius vector changes its length and changes its position so that it covers equal areas in equal terms. Okay, so the radius vector moves so that it covers equal areas in equal times. All right? And as I said, this has become known as the equal area rule. But if you're learning it for the GCSE, then you need to learn it a bit more carefully. All right? If they ask you about the second law, well, the bit everybody remembers is equal areas in equal times. All right, that will get you one out of two. Many people write things like the planet covers equal areas in equal times. Well, that's just nonsense. The planet doesn't cover any area, does it? The planet's just going along like a line. What is sweeping out the areas, covering the areas, is the radius vector. So you need to learn this as the radius vector, uh, a nice phrase, is sweeps out like the hands of a clock. And there is your definition of the second law. The radius vector of a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. It's a bit like a little poem, and everybody remembers like the first line or the last line, equal areas in equal times. But you must be clear what it is that's doing equal areas in equal times. It is not the planet. Don't put, instead of radius vector, the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. If you put a paintbrush on the planet, it wouldn't draw an area, would it? It would draw a line. All right? It's the hand of the clock, the radius vector, that sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Okay? So if the planet moves from there to there in one month, and the planet moves from there to there in one month, then these two areas will be the same size. All right? What's the upshot of that is when it's out here, the radius vector is very long, so the planet must move slowly. Think about it. every degree it turns, how much area is it covering? Loads, because the paintbrush is enormous. Down here, the paintbrush is very short, so to cover the area, the planet's got to move quickly. All right? And it's this idea of the quick and the slow motion of it that eventually led into Newton's law of gravity. Okay? But there's definitely two things to remember for the second law. It's the radius vector of the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Don't just remember the second bit. That's the easy bit to remember. It's the radius vector. Okay? Not the planet itself. Okay, let's have a look at um, Kepler's third law then, which uh, obviously is the third of his laws of planetary motion. Um, as we saw, the first law is all about the shape of the orbit. The second law is about the speed at which it goes around, how that changes. Um, and Kepler, right up almost the end of his life, spent a long time looking for patterns. Um, the third law is contained in this, I think it's one of his last books, called The Harmony of Worlds. Uh, he was convinced that he was finding a secret pattern hidden by God in the positions of the planets. Okay? Uh, why do they orbit at those distances and those times? He was convinced there was some sort of code, some sort of pattern to be found in there. Uh, as he said, his harmony of worlds he was looking for. And um, 
that's really what led him to the third law of planetary motion. Having a look at the table there, there's uh, one or two things we'll have a look at. If you look at the second column, uh, it talks about average distance from the sun. So when we say the distance from the sun of a planet, we tend to call it the average distance. Why is that? That's it. Okay. Think back to the first law, the orbits are elliptical. They're not as elliptical as that, but if you say what's the distance of this object from the sun, well, it's not quite that simple, is it? Because there are times when the planet's quite close, called... Perihelion. Perihelion, yep. And there are times when the planet's furthest away, called aphelion. All right. <coughs> In the case of the planets, they're not that different, but they are different. Okay. So the best way to say would be to take the average of those two, and that's why you can see in the table we use the word average. Okay. Uh, the second thing in the table looks a bit strange is again in that column is the unit. All right. You could talk about the distance of Mercury from the Sun in millions of kilometres. Nothing wrong with that. But a much neater way of doing it, if we use our baseline distance from the sun, or the average distance from the sun to the earth, if we use that as our unit of distance, then it becomes just much easier to manage the numbers of the solar system. So Mercury is in there at point 0.4, Venus is there at point 0.7, and so on. All right? In millions of kilometres, the numbers just become enormous. Okay? Um, now, we generally refer to that distance then, it's given a special name which you need to know, it's called the astronomical unit. Sometimes has the letters AU. All right. So you need to know that when you see capital A, capital U, that stands for the astronomical unit. The astronomical unit is generally taken to be the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun. All right. So if you're jotting it down, it's the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun, um, about 150 million kilometres. Okay. But as I say, today we're going to work in AU. All right. So the Earth is one, Mercury 0.4, Venus 0.7, and so on. And we do the same sort of thing with the time, don't we? The time to orbit, well again, we don't use seconds, although we could. We tend to use uh, years, all right? If we measure compared to the Earth, then obviously the Earth takes one year to go around, and we can measure in fractions of a year, as you can see in the table, okay? So Kepler was basically after a connection between the distance of a planet with the time it takes to go around, okay? Um, and hopefully the first thing you can see from that table is it's not an easy pattern. Uh, Kepler spent his life looking at difficult mathematical connections. Right, if, um, if things were really simple, I mean, let's take a really simple example. Imagine a planet orbiting twice as far out. So a planet X that orbits at 2 AU. If this pattern was really nice and simple, how many years would that take to go around? Yeah. That's what's called being proportional. If you orbit twice as far out, you take twice as long to go around. If you orbit three times as far out, 3 AU, you take three years to go around and so on. Have a look at the figures in the table, and I think you can see it's not that simple, is it? Look at Mars, for example. Mars is one and a half times further out. Does it take one and a half years? No. Is it something nice like three? And if we're expecting it to take one and a half years, it took three. You follow that there might be some sort of pattern going on there. Have a look at those numbers. It's not easy, is it? All right. For reasons we'll come back to, for reasons to do with gravity, and it was in fact Newton's, uh, sorry, Kepler's third law was one of the major things for getting Newton to think about his law of gravity. Although you hear all the stories about the apple, it was Kepler's third law that really gave Newton a big clue as to how gravity works. Okay. Um, the connection between the two things is not straightforward, okay? And it took Kepler quite a long time to come across it, okay? He even, I mean, he tried everything. He tried musical scales. He tried, you know, the intervals between musical scales. He thought perhaps they fitted to the orbits of the planets, and uh, he came up with this system where the positions and orbits of the planets was linked to musical scales, all right? He tried all kinds of things. This obviously doesn't work. This isn't true, obviously. Um, but in his... As I say, his book, The Harmony of Worlds, looking for these patterns, he came across this connection, which is, uh, if you take a planet, there it goes, 
If it takes time to go around, let's call that T, capital T, the time to go around, and R, obviously the average distance from the sun, all right, um, he found basically T squared is related to, or is proportional to, R cubed, all right. If you were to double the radius, then T would go as the radius cubed, but then you'd have to take the square root of that, all right? To take our planet, let's go back to our problem. Here's the sun, here's our planet orbiting at 2 AU. How long is that going to take to go around? The answer is going to be 2 cubed square rooted, all right? The time isn't related to r cubed. The time squared is linked to the radius cubed. Okay, so if you double the radius, r cubed will go up eight times, and that means t squared goes up eight times, which means t goes up the square root of eight, which is two and a bit, isn't it? Anyone with the calculator? Square root of eight. So a planet twice as far out as this as the, as the Earth would take about 2.82 years to go around. Why? Where does that number come from? If you cube the two and then square root it. Okay. So the connection is not between T and R. If you double R, you don't double T. All right. The connection, unfortunately, is between T squared and R cubed. Okay. Now we can make life a little bit simpler if we measure time periods in years and we measure R in AU, okay? And I think the easiest way to use this equation, or to use this idea, is basically to say that here's the sun, here's a whole bunch of different planets all going around at different times, different distances, etc, etc. For each of them, if you worked out the number t squared over r cubed, okay, you would get Same number. All right. Mars is one and a half times further out than the Earth, but if you work out the time it takes Mars to orbit squared over the radius cubed, you'll always get the same number. Okay. And pretty obviously that number's one because if you work it out for the Earth, it's one squared over one cubed, which is one. Okay. If you work it out for Mars, what's the sum going to be? T squared, well let's look in the table, T squared is going to be 1.88. So Mars, T squared is 1.88 squared over, R is 1.5 cubed. Can anybody work that out? Mars takes longer to go round, but it has a bigger orbit. So you can see the two halves of the fraction, top and the bottom, they both go up together, and hopefully they're going to give us the same number. So t squared over r cubed for the Earth is obviously 1. For Mars, it's 1.88 squared over 1.5 cubed. What does that give us? Very close to 1. All right, because I've rounded those figures off a bit. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah. The quantity t squared over r cubed is the same for any planet orbiting the sun, all right? If you measure your time period in years and you measure your radius in AU, okay? If you were to apply this to the moons of Jupiter and you measured in kilometers and hours or something, this would still work, but the number wouldn't be one, all right? And that's the kind of question which you don't have to do in the GCSE. In the GCSE, they limit the use of Kepler's third law to situations in the solar system where things are going around the sun, T is measured in years, R is measured in AUs, and that makes life a lot easier because T squared over R cubed is equal to 1. Okay? And you can see that with Mars, 1.88 squared over 1.5 cubed, again, equals 1. Mars takes longer to go round and has a bigger orbit, and they're in just the right proportion to keep T squared over R cubed the same. So this is Kepler's magic number. This is the number that all the planets have the same. You can take Pluto, long, long way out, very long distance, this number's much bigger, this number's much bigger, but when you divide them, 
you always get the same number. Okay? Right, let's have a look at the kind of thing you might be asked to do. And you will obviously need a calculator in the exam. It will need to be able to square and to square root and to cube and things like that without you having trouble finding which button. Okay? Let's try then, let's have planet X which is going round at a distance of 5 AU. Let's see if we can work out how long it's going to take to go round. Okay. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this is, as we said, T squared over R cubed is always going to equal 1 in the solar system. If you're measuring in AU and you're going to measure T in years. Well, a nice way of writing that then is like that. You can write it like that in the solar system if you're in AU and years, t squared equal to r cubed, and that makes this kind of question much easier because of course r cubed becomes 5 cubed, which is 1, 2, 5, isn't it? Now that's not the answer, that's t squared. Alright, it's a pesky little formula because it's got squares and cubes on both sides. Okay. So if you orbit at 5 AU, then we know that T squared is 125, which means T is the square root of 125, which is 11.1 roughly, 11.1 years. So if you were about 5 AU from the sun, you would expect to go around in about 11.1 that fit in with the actual planets? If you look at the table, does that fit in with what the actual planets do? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Now at 5 AU, can you see you are just inside the orbit of Jupiter? Jupiter takes 11.8. Can you see you're slightly closer, aren't you, than Jupiter? Jupiter's at 5.2, and you therefore take slightly less time to go around. Okay? Um, but in terms of what you need to know for the GCSE, that's pretty much it, okay? If you want to get excited, I think in the handout on this, there's um, a thing you can actually practice this. You could, for example, take the planet Jupiter. You could take Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. You could work out for Io, you could work out T squared over R cubed in uh, hours and metres if you wanted to and you would get some shocking great number. But if you worked it out for uh, Europa, you get the same number. Do you see? Whenever you've got things orbiting, they all share the same t squared over r cubed. Okay? In the GCSE, we limit that to planets in the solar system, where t squared over r cubed is the nice convenient one. All right? But the basic heart of Kepler's third law is that this is the magic number. This is the number that stays the same for any orbiting object. All the satellites of Jupiter have different t's and different r's, but they all have the same t squared over r cubed. Okay? You don't need to worry about that, that type of problem. Much simpler, in the solar system, if you measure in AU for your distance and years for your time, t squared over r cubed comes out as a nice handy one which means you can solve problems like that. Okay, let's do one more then, make sure we've got it. Uh, I'll leave you to this one. So let's do um, planet orbiting the sun at, uh, let's go a bit further out, let's go to 17. Looks like a horrible number. Imagine a planet at 17 AU from the sun. Can you calculate how long it would take to go around in years? Let's see how you do it. Again, in the exam, important to set out your working. All right? Don't just sit there, do it on your calculator, shove the number down. If you write that and 71's wrong, you're going to get nothing. All right? Make sure you show your working. So there's the equation. Uh, R is 17. Do we need to do 17 cubed, anybody? 4,000? And that, of course, remember, isn't the answer. That's what t squared equals. So you need to work out the square root of 4,913, which is... It will be, yeah, 49, look. It's going to be 
about 71 years, isn't it? Happy? Yep. Um, to the same level as the question. Oh, okay. The number in the question was the two significant figures, so you shouldn't give your answer to any more. All right. If your calculator is blithering on about 70.98567129, round it off to the same level as it was given to you. Okay.